Hey everyone, welcome to the art lecture series. Glad to have you, glad to be with you. I was thinking just this morning, I somehow, sometimes I'll transport to um, sort of this fantasy of another time, like, and I'm remembering uh, the, the lecture halls and um, we had the old lecture hall and then we were in the experimental theater and how lovely it was to all come together in those spaces. Um, and how lovely it is actually to come together in this space. So uh, I want to remind you in that spirit that when we move into the Q&A portion, there are two ways to um, ask questions, but the preferred way is to raise your hand, your virtual hand. We can't see you, but we could hear your voice to know that there's presence in this space because Otherwise, sometimes you just feel like you're speaking alone in a room. <laughs> um, I also want to quickly let you know that we have two more lectures this uh, quarter. Upcoming week six will be Gilda Shepard, who is a faculty member um, on, in the Tacoma campus of Evergreen. And she will be speaking on her recent um, award-winning documentary, Since I've Been Down. And we will get a chance to be able to view that um, during week five at some point. We'll, I'll, we'll let you know about what the details of how we access that will be when we get them. And then in week eight, we have Simone Nicole Savannah, writer of Uses of My Body, um, who will be joining us for the last lecture this quarter. Um, I don't think I'm forgetting anything else. Um, and I would like to introduce um, Anthony uh, Modest from um, the Program Foundational Studio Projects, who will be introducing today's speaker, Patty Loper. So let's welcome Anthony. Welcome everyone, and thank you for being with us today. My name is Anthony Modest. I'm a Foundational Studio Projects student at the Evergreen State College. I'm humbled and excited to introduce to you today an artist whose present interests span through plant communication and multi-species engagement, and whose work challenges how we think about materiality in our human age. Grounded in painting, moving through drawing, stop motion animation, and art installation, and performance, their work stretches through disciplines. With subject matter delving into feminist utopianism, new materialism, and the ecological imaginary, this artist is this artist stilted and textured landscapes are steeped in imagination and environmental purpose, are, in conversation, are also in conversation with the work of writers like Ursula K. Le Guin and K. Jemison and surreal painter, surrealist painters like Key Sage, stirring, stirring thought with questions of the future while speaking about the present. She currently teaches at the, at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts at Tufts University and her work has been exhibited nationally at the Clay Center for the Arts and Sciences in West Virginia and the Mattress Factory in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in addition to international locations. Everyone turn up your imaginations and give a warm welcome to Patty Loper. Hi, Anthony, thank you so much. That was absolutely beautiful. I will try to live up to that amazing introduction. And a huge thank you to Shaw Osha for inviting me to speak at Evergreen College. Um, I am an enormous fan of Evergreen and their art department and have been for many years. So it's really just such an honor to be here today. Um, before I launch into talking about my own practice, I feel like it's really important to acknowledge that the ground beneath our feet is historically the home of indigenous peoples many of whom have been forced to leave for other lands. I am speaking to you today from my studio in Queens, New York, on land that was originally home to the Muncie, Lenape, and Canarsie tribes. So, okay, I'm gonna get started. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen, and I'm gonna really pray for no technical glitches. If I suddenly freeze and go away, it means my computer has frozen, and so this will be a chance for everybody to take a short bio break. Um, 
Okay, and I'm also going to acknowledge that I have not been able to get rid of my sharing windows, so you're going to see a small strip at the bottom of the screen here. All right, that housekeeping out of the way. Uh, the lecture today is called Place Thought, Science Fiction, and the Ecological Imaginary. Okay. So a few things, a few operating principles about, about my work is that it is fluid and interdisciplinary and the medium will tend to follow the ideas. So individual works will often look very different from one another and often many different kinds of work can be combined together into one project. So below you see two, uh, two very different works that are both done by one artist, that is me. Um, on the left, we have a large scale exhibition that is site responsive, multi-technology, multidisciplinary, and um, responding very much to place. And on the right, we have a small drawing that was done in a notebook. And I consider both of these to be equally important aspects of my practice. So the work is also responsive to time and place. And to talk a little bit about that, I'm showing you an early, uh, a, an early installation piece from 2014. And this is called, uh, After Lebius, a model for drawing. I consider this to actually be a 3D, like a three-dimensional drawing that is responding to this kind of like interesting architectural space. The space is actually in New York City at the Drawing Center, which is kind of a well-known uh, museum that focuses on drawing. And so this is my interpretation of a drawing. And I really wanted to collaborate with this sort of unusual space underneath a large staircase. So it was responding to this architectural space and the work was also responding to Lebius Woods, a theoretical architect and their ideas about ethics and the built environment. Um, since we are moving into a time of climate crisis, ethics and how we build things is important on many different levels. So that brings me to the idea that this work also responds to political and ecological time. And in this moment, thinking about the climate crisis, about global warming and the specifics of time, place and how we are responding to this moment is really important and something I think about a lot in my work. And as you can see, this piece is combining, I hope you can see this, it combines building with drawing, animation, and technology. I don't try to hide technology in my work. I use a lot of it and it's, it's always evident. And I really like the way that the, that the sort of like aesthetics of the technology complicate the hand-builtness of the work that I make. Uh, this is um, West Virginia. This is 2017. And I'm going to basically walk you through, to talk about these ideas, I'm going to walk you through a few of my projects from beginning to end. And everything always begins with this idea of place thought, that each place has its own special vibrations that are emanating from the land. And so in 2017, I was invited to, to do an exhibition at the Clay Center for the uh, Arts and Sciences in West Virginia. And it was, it was a really interesting time early 2017. Um, the country was still processing the 2016 election. And I was really thinking a lot about the new administration support for extractivist industries. This was very much on my mind and I think a lot of people's mind. And West Virginia really made me think of two things. It made me think of the beautiful nature and the coal mining industry. So I went to West Virginia and I traveled around, uh, especially around the Charleston area, to get a sense of what it looked like and what it felt like and what the people there were thinking about and doing and just also what was happening with the land. And particularly interesting to me initially was sort of how water was moving through the land, how there, it sort of seemed to be this huge, massive amounts of water moving through massive amounts of land. And it seemed very connected to plants and animals and the people and everything felt very connected. 
So the land in West Virginia is obviously really beautiful, uh, but it has also been damaged in some places and often it has been devastated by the coal mining industry. And it was really easy to find evidence of this. So it was everywhere. Basically, I drove out of Charleston and by the side of the highway, I found this image here on the left um, where there were just piles of coal and coal mining equipment and, and um, you know, kind of like this distribution equipment. And that was a little, I don't know, I was surprised that it was so evident and that it was so obvious. And it was a little, I don't know. I didn't like that very much, to be honest, but it was the reality of the situation. And I also did find some areas that were much more hopeful. Um, so for example, here on the right is a sign from a park in which the land and the water have been restored after being polluted by coal mining runoff. And the people who made the park were really conscientious about wanting to educate visitors about what had happened there, about how bad it had gotten and the steps that were needed to take to repair the ecology at least somewhat. And when I was there, it was, it was very beautiful and it felt like a healthy place. So some more research photos. So this was sort of interesting. Um, on the left, we're seeing a sign that was at a public rest area. And uh, it says, obviously, no food, no drinks, no pets, no firearms. And I have lived in New York City now for a long time. And the idea that people were walking around with firearms in public social space was really unsettling for me. And I didn't want to be judgmental, but it was just a very different social space than, than I was accustomed to. And um, on the right, we see an image of a house that was damaged by some unusual flooding that had happened in a small town uh, close to Charleston. And something that became really evident as I was traveling around to these small communities was that residents with less access to resources seem to live in the lower lying areas and therefore were uh, more greatly impacted by flooding. And I saw this in this small community. So my travels around West Virginia showed me a few different things. And I think two of the main takeaways that I had were number one, this was a community that I didn't really fully understand. And I was an outsider coming into this community. And number two, that people here are already feeling the effects of global warming and unusual weather. And so there's an urgent, there's just an urgent conversation to be had. And I found the tension between this unknowing of the people, by uh, un my unknowing of the people, and the urgency of the conversation to produce like a like a nice friction that I could that I could really work with. So let's see. This is a big experiment right here to see if this video will play. And it's playing. That's great. So I'm just going to talk over it here for a minute. So the Clay Center, where the exhibition was happening, is a fantastic place. It's an art museum, but it's also a science museum, and it attracts families with small children. And I decided that it was really like the little kids who were my main audience here. So I knew I wanted to talk about science and renewable energy technology. And to communicate, it was going to take a story that could both capture the kids' imagination, uh, but also not alienate the parents who might be fairly conservative. So science fiction seemed like a way to create a fantasy space in which things that would otherwise be controversial would be kind of rendered acceptable. So I chose the 1960 fiction, science fiction comedy, Visit to a Small Planet as sort of a template to use. So the film story isn't really important, but the title I loved and the B-movie aesthetic provided a, a really nice template that I could work with. And what we're looking at right now is actually a little snippet from, from Visit to a Small Planet from 1960. So after my visit, to West Virginia, I went back to my studio, uh, which is small and located, at the time it was located in Midtown Manhattan, and I just went back to get to work. Now, this is a really good opportunity to talk about economy of means. If you were in the workshop last week, y'all all know what economy of means means, you know, so you've been, you're familiar with it. But in case anybody wasn't on there, um, I'm thinking about it in the way that the Shara Kahanoff 
uh, a quote is really thinking about it where it's, it's the phrase economy of means suggests making do with a small amount. So to live frugally is to live economically, to carefully manages, manage resources so they go as far as possible. So the challenge of my practice is that I'm always limited by what materials are available uh, and also my time, which is also limited. I work full time uh, as a professor. Um, my abilities, especially in building and installation and video are somewhat limited because I am only trained in painting. And of course, there are always financial um, resource limitations. So the challenge is that while the final result is usually a really large scale installation, it almost always begins with my small studio on a shoestring budget with not that much time. So it's a pretty normal situation to, in this situation to have to figure out how to make something big from a small space and without all that much in the way of resources. So this is fine with me. It dovetails really well with my overarching ecological concerns about how material is used and reused and how to keep the carbon footprint as low as possible. Um, let's see, just to speed ahead just a little tiny bit, um, I really want to talk about this video. So, okay, so economy of means, not much money, not much time, not much space. How do we like make something happen? So I kind of like to use these really direct, almost clumsy methods uh, that wind up actually being sort of playful and humorous. So I decided that the show was going to be a story about a place that was alive. So literally the place is alive, the land is alive. And, um, and also how water runs through that land, like in West Virginia, and about how that community that lives there, this fictional community that could be you know, on another planet or, or a different earth, an earth of the future or an earth of now that we just haven't discovered yet, um, how that community uses re renewable energy. So this video conflates the human body and a mountain in the most direct way that I could think of. And while this is a time saver, I also um, wind up often kind of using these initial sketches, these little gestures, uh, they wind up actually being part of the show. So I'm just gonna play this right now. And go. Okay, so once I figured that out, you know, this video really helped me figure out some of my ideas. Then I packed everything up and brought it to the Clay Center. And so this is the space that I was working with. As you can see, it's beautiful. It's really, also really huge. Um, and I'm just gonna walk you through some installation in progress shots so that you can get an idea of how things get built up in this work. So here um, you can see, uh, uh, you know, that this just is kind of being um, built up slowly by hand. A really important idea in terms of economy of means is that often the way that you make resources go a long way is through labor. And um, for me, this is really a labor of love. And I feel like humans just in kind of intrinsically understand this way of building that people really like to be able to sort of follow the hand in making and that we evolved as a species to use an economy of means sort of process with material to make things to stretch things out to make a little bit go a long way and um, it's really interesting to see how that can translate into an art making practice so a few more images in, in process. And I wanted to show you the image here on the lower right. So this is from the entranceway to the gallery. So when you walk in, this is what you see. And I built other stuff around the periphery of this sort of central lit up structure. Uh, but the lit up structure was really the main point. That was like the land that was alive. And, um, a really great thing about this show was that during the installation, the gallery was open and people could watch the progress as the show was being built. 
And for me, it really began to feel like things were on the right track. When kids would come into this doorway, they would see this view that you're seeing on the lower right, and they would just take off and start running towards the structure at the top of their, you know, um, speed and get like yelling. And it really seemed like I was getting a response, but it was also a little terrifying because these tiny bottled bodies were like hurtling towards this relatively fragile sculpture that I was building. But it was so interesting because even if the kids were really little, they would run up and they would just, they would stop short before they actually got to the sculpture and um and then they would just kind of like look at it and uh the show was up for a few months and during the entire course of the show there were never any don't touch signs or any stanchions put up and the work was like never damaged so that was um it made me kind of feel like the handmadeness and the obvious vulnerability was in a way it's actually its own protection um, another really wonderful side benefit of having children around while I was working is they're really honest and they will tell you what they see. So it's pretty abstract and doesn't necessarily read as, as land. And so they would tell me, you know, what it looked like to them. And so they said it looked like a telescope, an alien, a machine. Some were like, I don't know what this is. Um, but I think because it was handmade and shiny, it got, it kind of got a response. Um, and this is what it wound up looking like in the end. Another shot. And because the landscape was so abstract, I made a, a giveaway coloring book that actually told the story of this place so that people could, um, you know, get clued into my thinking a little bit more. Few more installation shots. It's really hard to document work like this. FYI for you, for you art students who are thinking about getting into the complicated installation game. So something uh, that that happened during the course of the show was I had built these channels and receptacles all throughout the piece, and poured blue paint through them. And uh, it's a little hard to see, but you can kind of get a sense of that happening here. Just a few more details. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the next exhibition that I'm gonna walk you through, which is actually my last exhibition. So uh, this show was installed in 2019 at, in Pittsburgh at a place called the Mattress Factory. And it was supposed to be up for about a year, but it actually closed a little early because of the pandemic. And um, the exhibition was called Laboratory for Other Worlds. And it sort of revolved around a, a, a science fiction video that is called Mushroom Cyclops Space Alien Protest Sign. And as always, I started out with a site visit. And as you can see, here's the, the gallery that I was using on the left. And interestingly, the Mattress Factory is actually known for super funky galleries with lots of in interesting architectural quirks. Uh, but it so happened that the, or the particular gallery that they gave me for my show didn't have a lot of texture or history to respond to. Um, in, in fact, what we're looking at here, in case you can't tell, um, it's they've put up a bunch of drywall. So they've, they've drywalled the walls. They've even drywalled the ceilings. The floor is, is like painted gray and it was all painted white before I installed. And they do a magnificent job of like cleaning up the galleries and making sure they're really pristine and beautiful before you move in. But this was really pristine. I mean, there was just, there were no features to deal with. It was like, you know, the white cube for sure. And in fact, it was so like kind of hermetically sealed off that it, it reminded me of something like Stanley Kubrick's set for Space Odyssey 2001 that was shot like way back in 1968. And, um, you know, to be honest, I can deal with a spaceship. So I was kind of like, okay, this is not what I was expecting, but I love it and, and we're, gonna, we're gonna use it. So 
as usual, my work begins with a video. And this might seem like a little bit of a, of a non sequitur, but uh, at the time I was really interested in researching the set of rare periodicals that chronicle identity formation and protest art by feminist, civil rights, LGBTQIA and incarcerated groups. And I really felt like this could sort of enliven this sort of science and extraterrestrial kind of um, science fiction fantasy that I was trying to bring to life. So there's a wonderful archive of these rare periodicals at Duke University and I spent a lot of time researching them and these are some of the images that I came across in, in this archive. And I was inspired to make uh, a utopian science fiction video and this is these ideas and this sort of energy, this is my utopia. So I knew that this would become entangled into the body of the installation. And so I made this short video. Again, this is sort of one of these like really quick videos where I'm just sort of thinking out ideas and I called it good news from outer space. And let's see if we can get it to play. another quick video and I should also add that um, at this point I have started working with a musical collaborator named Andrew Renato who is fabulous and uh, they are the uh, musician playing on that video. So okay so the plan for the installation at the mattress factory became to expand the idea of this short video into a longer film with a more involved set. And then the set itself would form the basis of the large installation. So again, I returned to my tiny studio in Midtown Manhattan and began building the set. And as you can see, I'm painting on the wall to sort of make a backdrop behind the, you know, the set, uh, this sort of weird planetary landscape. Um, and I, I just sort of, it just sort of seemed like it needed a context. And I kept thinking back to that mattress factory gallery that was so blank. It wasn't giving a lot of intrinsic context. And it seemed like that context was going to have to be built in some way. And so I started thinking about, again, going back to the well of these old science fiction B movies. They're really, I don't know, they're really, they're kind of like, like film economy of means. And I love the way in these old, um, films like Forbidden Planet, which this is a still from, how uh, you could you could see the action just sort of happening in front of like a painted backdrop that was very obviously a painted backdrop. And since my background is in painting, I'm actually trained in, in a painter, as a painter, um, it seemed like a good place to start in terms of making like the place of the video. So about the time I started thinking about these paintings, I was scheduled to do a residency at this place called Yado in Saratoga Springs, New York. And for anyone who doesn't know about them, artist residencies are fantastic places. So they will house and feed you, give you a studio and allow you time away from your everyday life to make work. They can be so productive. They're sort of like, they're, they're considered awards. So you apply for them. And if you're accepted, you get to go to them. And usually they're free of charge and sometimes they pay you. Um, they can last anywhere from a week to several months. 
And I would say it seems like most people go on average for about a month and that's usually about how long I go for. And I also wanna acknowledge that it's really a luxury to be able to do one of these um, residencies, even if they don't cost you anything and even if they pay you because most people have to work full time. But if you're uh, fortunate and you're a teacher like I am, or if you are in a position where you can take time off of a job, um, you can really like find some time sometimes to go to these. So, okay, so back to Yado. So my goal was to create paintings in response to the extensive grounds. Yado is on the grounds of this sort of old industrialist estate that was, that was you know, contributed to or, or uh, donated to become an artist retreat. And the studio that they gave me, you can see it on the left, it, was, it is by far the nicest studio I have ever worked in. It's called The Greenhouse. And it's, it, it was, it's a new studio, but it was built on the foundation of an old greenhouse that was located right outside of the formal Rose Garden on, on this like magnificent estate. Uh, so um, I don't have a car, but I knew I wanted to do a bunch of paintings here. So I just brought a bunch of small old reused canvases um, and packed them up and brought them on the train. And you can see them sort of laid out on the floor there uh, of my studio. And now when I was first working on this, I kind of thought that um, it would be sort of like the wilder and more secluded places in Yado that would be, uh, you know, the setting for my interstellar landscape. And so on the upper left here, you're seeing, this is actually deep in the woods. There's this weird, kind of like little structure next to this lake, but this is like very wooded and very remote. There's no people around. Um, and I started trying to work with that, but it, it wasn't really giving me anything. So I actually wound up being much more interested in the rose garden right out of this, at, right outside of my studio. Um, and it was much more inspiring. Uh, it had all of these really interesting quirky little things like this gate and this pile of rocks in the middle of a pond. And then there was a formal fountain. And so this imaginary interstellar garden began with sketches that I actually began interspersing with text from the Duke University research. And I was, in, and I was sort of importing that into my, into my imaginary interstellar protest rose garden. Um, and eventually all of the pieces of the, you know, these kind of like small canvases, um, first I sort of laid it out in an, in drawing form and then I, um, and then I painted them on the canvases and put them together to make kind of like one epic, like multi-panel painting that, um, that I was actually pretty happy with at the end of the day. Um, it felt like a really imaginative act to make this. And, and I think that when we're dealing with the climate crisis, imagination is so important. And so I really let the imagination fly free. And then I went back to my studio in Manhattan, keep returning here and put the paintings up with the, with the uh, video set and didn't work. Just didn't, didn't work at all. And so now those paintings, they're just kind of like, they're living on as their own separate project. And I actually, this kind of like cir black circle on the wall with white dots to be stars worked out beautifully at the, in the end to, um, to be the context for, for this set. So the video set once again became the focus and we're kind of seeing um, the video set in a much more completed form. And it was in this form that I actually shot the video stills to make a stop motion animation. Um, so the video stills were created first before I went to Pittsburgh and then in Pittsburgh while I was installing, I actually edited the video all together. So just to give you a little bit more background about the kind of the characters in the video. So the main character was based on that sign, you know, the sign, the like spaceship sign that came down from outer space and, you know, started generating all of that text and images from the protest art. Um, but as I was working on it for this video, it kind of began developing into this weird creature that had an eyeball in the center, and then these other arms that started to look like mushroom caps um, to hold the protest language. And, um, and, you know, just to sort of explain all of this, um, 
time, as I mentioned, is a huge limitation. And so I'm usually in a hurry and I'm just working fast. And that makes this work sometimes seem like a stream of consciousness. And funnily enough, that actually um, really dovetails with the surrealists who I'm really interested in because of the way that they use these same techniques, only they call it like automatic writing or automatic drawing where you write or you draw or you do something without a plan and just sort of doing it in this way that kind of like accesses the subconscious without letting the conscious brain really be, you know, really uh, direct things. And so, you know, they were using this to really develop totemic imagery. And, you know, so this subconscious totemic imagery is something that I really like and really respond to. And I intentionally work with it to incorporate it into uh, the way I think through ideas. And um, so another character, and she did actually, sadly, she made it into the installation, but she did not make it into the video. This is um, a space alien, and here she is in my studio, uh, very much in progress. And this is the space spacecraft. Um, she is also in progress in this image. And I should say that uh, both of these images are using incorporating older pieces of artwork and and basically like garbage. So this is made totally made up out of um, old styrofoam that I found by the side of the road. And and here is the video. And I would say that this is the final video, but it's actually not the final video. It's the video that I used in the installation, but I don't consider it finished, um, especially the sound. I'm still working through the sound with my collaborator. And, um, and something that I'll add about all of my videos is I really like the way that they are in conversation with early cinema and the way that they are, I said this already, but they're sort of like really skirting the edge of failure and that that kind of becomes funny and kind of playful, but also kind of like, you know, there's a pathos to it. So anyway, that's just the setup for this and I'll go ahead and play it. And this is about, um, I think it's about four minutes long.
Okay, so that was the video. Um, all right, so once this was created and you know, sort of like outlined, I had to figure out how the video set was going to live as an installation. So I know that the video I, I, I know that the video and installation were talking about the ecological imaginary. And I want to talk to you about that for just a moment here. So to understand the ecological imaginary, it's important to understand the social imaginary, which is basically the idea that our society is made up, that we agree upon a set of values, codes, institutions, and laws that define our society. And um, so knowing that, then the ecological imaginary, you know, at, it, at its most basic level, um, acknowledges how the non-human world shapes our reality and considers how our political and social values, codes, and institutions and laws could be reimagined to better serve humans, non-humans, and planet Earth. So this is a complex idea, and my response to that is to just sort of have, as you can tell, have these like wild flights of imagination um, because I trust, I trust our brain. I trust our brain as part of a larger eco e ecology. And I think that, I think that, um, that it's important to have a space for like a broad imagination in, a, in the conversation around the climate crisis. Um, so, uh, you know, this is a complex idea and I think that, that I wanted to think about it um, in a very open way that combined painting, drawing, video, set design, handmade installation, and many various forms of technology, including solar energy. Um, and of course my normal um, MO, which is an economy of means. So here on the left-hand side, you can see an early Photoshop mock-up. So since I'm usually preparing work in a different city than where it will be shown, uh, I make these Photoshop mock-ups. Uh, they wind up being a good way to understand how the space and this work like might live together. And also, um, you know, when you move on into a, a, a professional capacities, um, curators and preparators who work on shows really appreciate having this kind of understanding. Um, so even though this is, so this is really early and is nothing like what the final exhibition looks like, but it sort of was an, an initial step in figuring out how to work with this particular space. And what we're looking at on the right is a bird's eye view of the gallery. So that was actually sort of the footprint of the, of the gallery. And on it, I made a tech map sort of figuring out where all of the technology could be placed. So the show um, had video it had sound, both sound that was emanating and sound that was being recorded and then, and then um, broadcast into the gallery space. Uh, there were surveillance cameras showing parts of the exhibition that would have otherwise been hard to see because it was a complex space. And then also an off-grid solar panel system that was not connected to the city of Pittsburgh power source at all, but connected only to the sun to produce energy. And this ran some of the tech, not all of it, but it was able to run some of it. And it was a, boy, it was a real education for me. So what you see here in the map in blue is the solar panel um, technology and the red is the regular video and surveillance technology. So that kind of gives you a, a sense of the map of the space. So after the video was shot and the, and the set was transported to the mattress factory and all of the tech was figured out, um, uh, you know, all of this got transported to the mattress factory and we got to work. So there were amazing assistants there who really know what they're doing and were in just so invaluable in making all of this a reality. Um, things like this just sometimes cannot happen on your own. And so opening the space up and holding open space for other people's creativity was very exciting for me. So what we wound up doing was building a laboratory around the set. So there was the video set, the sort of like ruined planetary surface. And then there was a laboratory around it. So the idea was that there were unseen but omnipresent scientists collecting information from the landscape, like as if the people who were writing the lab notes in the video were also working in the laboratory or running the laboratory. And so they were collecting sound that was emanating from the landscape. And there were these essences from the landscape uh, and liquids that were being distilled into vials. Um, 
and uh, and just a little bit about the solar panel array. So it was split between the roof. Um, so two of the panels wound up going on the roof and then there was one in this room that was adjacent to the main gallery. So this room had windows. The gallery was closed off from windows and, and kind of was in its own space, but right next to it, this small room had windows um, that overlooked the street and let in a lot of light so it could hold a solar panel. Um, and also people could see this from the street without going into the museum. Um, so this held the solar panel, the, sorry, the solar tech and also some video screens that were attached to surveillance cameras that were in the main part of the gallery. So these surveillance cameras were running a visual feed to these three video screens that were broadcasting the images of the gallery to the street so that people could see the exhibition without paying the museum entrance fee. Um, and, uh, and then, an, additional layer of complication. There were also surveillance cameras on the roof that were surveying the weather and giving visual access to what was happening on the roof to viewers inside the gallery. So yes, the ecological imaginary can get very complicated. And this is what it looked like in the end. You might recognize this from uh, the earlier slide. Um, and let's see, I'm just gonna walk you through. These are just a few various Shots, it's very hard to document this kind of work because it winds up being immersive. So the person's body is is in the space and you have to like duck down to see things. You have to get up on your tiptoes. There's movement, there's sound, you know, so it really brings the human body into um, into a like a like a space of being engulfed it. Um, and yeah. It was just a complicated space. Uh, I tend to use and reuse and keep accumulating old work into new work. So what we're looking at here is a detail of the space alien who was made up of many tiny earlier previous works that kind of all got smashed together into, into her body. And I'm just gonna show you like a one minute, 30 second video in uh, um, of just documenting the installation. Okay, um, so this brings us to now, and that's good because we're almost out of time, but I really wanted to uh, show you just a little bit about my current research. So during lockdown, um, you know, this is a really terrible and difficult time that we are all living through. Um, and for me, what has happened is the making and research process has slowed down quite a bit and has been accompanied by less making and more reading, thinking, and just sort of being in one place here in Queens and observing and observing nature, myself in relationship to nature, 
And, uh, and I, I think that, you know, a silver, silver lining of this time, if I could call it that, is, um, is that I think that this has been helpful to um, the thought process here. So here under current research, I have a quote from Donna Har Haraway um, that is, it matters what thought we think, thoughts we think thoughts with. So Donna Haraway to me, she is a feminist anthropologist and theorist and um, really thinks deeply in ways about multi-species coexistence, how to make kin and, and how to basically exist and live and thrive on a planet that is has been damaged. Um, and to me, she exemplifies what feminist utopia can mean, which is that you don't just point out problems, you actually put into the world what you want to see there. And she makes a strong argument for um, the life force of all things and the entanglement of that life force um, in ways that we don't fully understand, um, but that are crucial for us to understand in order to go forward. So my research has been based, um, well, I'll just say right before we went into lockdown, I was planning this uh, really big project that involved observing and mapping the native plants across New York City. And when we locked down, that became, you know, that went from like this whole citywide, project to just being really thinking about the space that is very near my house. It's actually the largest green space. Um, it's just a short walk from where I live and where my studio now is. Um, and uh, it's called All Faiths Cemetery. It runs through the center of Queens, New York on land that was originally considered to be um, you know, not suitable for farming because it was too hilly. And, um, and it's really important to recognize that uh, there, uh, for thousands of years before that, it was land that was in fact cultivated by the Munsee, Lenape, and Canarsie tribes. Um, at this time in its current iteration, it's a very loosely managed space and has become home to many species of plants, birds, insects, and small mammals. And my research has really uh, began by focusing on two interlocking ideas. Uh, the first being the idea of biophilia. Um, and that is an awareness in humans um, of the connections between humans and non-human beings. And non-human beings can be plants, they can be animals, it can be the land, it can be stones, um, it, and it can be um, other unseen things like weather or spirits. Um, and then also uh, this idea of care ethics where human interconnectedness with the natural world leads individuals to an empathetic, emp empathic concern towards not just the environment, but also towards each other. And this for me felt like a really good place to start. And this began with an understanding of native plant populations. As you can see here in the, in the image, uh, lots of native plants happening. They're just springing up, you know. Um, biophilia and care ethics, while relatively new terms, um, I'm sure you can guess this, actually describe an older way of knowing, but one that's largely been forgotten. It recognizes that natural growing, native growing plants organize their own holobiomes, regulate bacteria, insect and animal populations as well. And many of these plants produce chemicals that are anti-inflammatory and antibacterial and also otherwise medicinal for humans as well as animals, birds, and other plants. So we all like evolved together on this planet, right? And the plants are actually an enormous key for regulating so much of our environment and they hold um, a lot of really valuable information. So almost all of the local plants that I've identified in the cemetery are actually edible for humans and contain beneficial and, medis and medicinal properties. And I'm just gonna, there's a lot of information on this slide, so I'm just gonna sort of read through it really quickly. So these are, you know, I've, I'm showing you three out of like maybe 20 or 25 plants that I've been able to identify at all faiths. And I'll begin by saying, never eat a plant unless it's been identified by an expert, because interestingly, mo almost everything I find is edible, but the things that I find that aren't edible will kill you. So, um, so you know, you don't want to eat something that you don't know what it is. But um, 
all of these plants, even some of the ones that will kill humans, are beloved by pollinators. And each of these plants will attract a different species of bees, butterflies, and moths. I had no idea how many different varieties of, of bee lived around me until I slowed down and looked at them. I mean, they're all different sh shapes and sizes. There's these little tiny blue ones. I mean, it's amazing. Um, and these plants, they don't grow, they're not in competition with each other. Our capitalist system makes us think that the natural world is actually competing, but that these different species are competing. They are not. They actually grow much better together with multi-species all together in the same space. And um, their different plant chemistries help support each other and regulate different aspects of microbes and insects. So this healthy, healthy chemical biome is really beneficial for humans as well. And sadly, um, most of these plants, um, and actually all of the ones that I've listed here, and I think all of the ones that I've identified that are native plants at all faiths are considered weeds. And landscapers, um, if they get the chance, will kill them with poison. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of education that needs to happen around what's happening just sort of like right around us in our communities that we are living in. So these are a few examples of the, as I said, many native plants with similar properties at all faiths and these um, similar plant communities to this one exist across New York City and uh, across the world. So ragweed, um, again, weed, um, is universally hated because it brings on allergies, but however, it is medicinal, antiseptic, it is a fever reducer, and it helps heal insect bites. It holds a very important uh, niche in the ecological, you know, in kind of like the plant um, uh, community um, ecological system um, at all faiths. And, uh, and interestingly enough, can also be made into a, uh, a, a cure for hay fever. So plantain leaf, it's actually um, a plant that's become naturalized and was brought over by very early um, white colonial settlers and is one of the nine sacred herbs of the Saxons. Uh, the plantain leaf is edible and has antiseptic and anti-inflammatory properties and is also awesome for insect bites if you just like mash it up and put it on a, on a bite. And good for burns too. It's actually better than aloe for burns. Uh, bull thistle is particularly hated because it's really big and spiny, um, but it is actually edible uh, for humans and is completely beloved by um, pollinators. They're, they go nuts over these flowers. It's so cool. So, okay. So this research into like what's around me has been um, really influenced by uh, sort of more theoretical research that I'm doing into new materialism, vibrant matter, and non-human participatory research practices. So new materialism is a pretty complicated interlocking set of theories, but they essentially all revolve around this idea of vibrant matter. And that is the idea that non-humans, plants, animals, things, and unseen forces have agency and shape our world in profound ways that our Western language and science have trouble capturing. So it's, it's, re it's actually really difficult sometimes to talk about these ideas because the English language, which is unfortunately the only language that I speak, has not evolved with these ideas. And so we, it's almost like we have to come up with new language to talk about this stuff. And that includes non-human participatory research practices. So this practice um, by all manner of researchers considers non-human actors as collaborators rather than objects of study. So they don't consider like I'm alive and sentient and this thing that I'm looking at is non-sentient and only partially alive or not alive at all. It, it, it really considers the um, agency of everything. So, okay, so what does that look like when you're trying to make art? Um, so here, uh, here are, um, uh, uh, here's how I'm kind of handling this. So this project is really in early phases in spring and summer. I spent just a lot of time observing and spending time outside. And um, in the fall, I collected seeds from what I, who I consider my collaborators and I'm waiting for spring so I, I can germinate them and grow them and, you know, invite them to collaborate with me. And so these are just a few of the 20 odd species of seed that I have 
collected so far. And in the meantime, while I'm waiting for spring to get here, I'm using some house plants as collaborators to try to figure out how to begin to think with plants. And I, you know, because this is so new and um, uh, I don't intrinsically have the cognitive and language skills to deal with this, it's just clumsy and I'm just kind of accepting that this is clumsy and rudimentary. Um, and, I, and I'm just thinking about the fact that artists are really good at figuring out how to do things that we don't know how to do. And so I'm trusting that process. And I think of these as some early thinking with plant experiments. So what we're looking at right now is a thinking with plant device that allows a non-sighted person and this non-sighted person could either be blindfolded or they could have their um, eyes closed or they could just not have access to vision. Um, and anyway, this non-sighted person is invited to take the handle and to feel out the spatial arrangement of the plant with these sort of like delicate little feelers on the end of this like sort of, you know, handle. And uh, I know that this is, you know, not the most sophisticated technology that you've probably ever seen in your life, but uh, my desire here is to um, unprivilege sight and to also find new ways to feel things. Um, and so I'm just going to close right now with, um, uh, with some drawings because my practice is now literally seasonal. Um, it's dependent not just on place and the, and the, and the political, the politics of time, um, but it's dependent on growing conditions and plant timelines. And so I'm whiling away the, you know, less cold than they used to be winter months here in Queens, making these psychic corporeal maps of the cemetery. And I'm really thinking about the indigenous feminist idea of body territory, that where a community buries its dead is an extension of our bodies and also our ultimate home places. And something that I've been very aware of um, spending a lot of time in a cemetery um, is even though it's very quiet, it's... Um, there have been a lot of new graves uh, here in Queens um, since the since the pandemic began, and so it's just a thing that's happening. Um, so this is our home now, and this is things that we're thinking about. And I think of these maps as showing three different states of all faiths, much in the way Anonymous Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights, if you know that altarpiece, um, shows three different states of Earth. So uh, I, these correlate to heaven, earth, and hell. And my idea now is like, well, why just three? Why aren't there like 10 states? And so I'm going to keep thinking about what these states might be. And, um, and they're all the same place. They're all, all faiths. And it could be at different times, or it could be just like different iterations of the same place. So this drawing would correlate to earth. And as you can see, I'm still working with um, integrating the protest language and protest text into the works. Um, this drawing correlates to hell, and we see the centered, disembodied individual sitting on a throne that is also a toilet on a pile of excrement surrounded by skeletons with like a nuclear cloud hanging over them and a pollution cloud and, you know, their excrement is like falling from the toilet down into the underworld. So, um, so that's happening. And, um, and then this is the, um, drawing that correlates to heaven. And we see a live earth that is multi-species and incorporates um, many different types of lives into the, in, into the land. And so it's still a land, but it's also got human parts and tentacles and eyeballs and, and um, trees as legs. And so that is, that is it. And I'm gonna stop sharing. And thank you so much if you're still here for your time and attention. I really appreciate it.